uh, let's move to our um, final speaker. Um, Aminadav Dikman is a professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at the Hebrew University. Uh, Dikman is a fellow of the Academy of Hebrew Language and a laureate of the Prime Minister's Prize and the Chonichovsky Prize for translation. He's the author of the Psalms in uh, Russian poetry and more recently, Shurot of Shurot, Masot Mechkarim Rishimot. He's a renowned translator, primarily of poetry. I'll mention but a few of his most recent translations. Katzlav Vavered, Shira Latinit Mimeh Benaim, Resisim Yivaniim, Mifchar, just published uh, uh, recently. Ami, please. So two thanks for the presentation and the invitation. Ladies and gentlemen, in today's lecture, I would like to survey several Hebrew works that are linked directly or obliquely in reality or in imagination to Dante's Commedia and Vita Nuova. Some of these texts have already been explored from this perspective by many scholars in the past. I hope to add something to the research towards the end of this communication. Let us begin by saying that Jewish literature has its own traditional vision of heaven and hell. Among the many things, I hear a terrible echo. Something can be done about that? No, okay. Among the many early medieval midrashim, one finds several small tractates that deal with both heaven and hell. Among those, mention should be made of the tractate of hell, Masechet Gehinom, out of which I quote but one little passage to offer you a taste of the rest. Said Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, as I was walking the road one day, I met the prophet Elijah, blessed be his memory, who said to me, would you like me to bring you to the gates of hell? I replied, yes. He then showed me people hung by their noses, other by their hands, other by their arms, people hung by their tongues, people hung by their legs, women hung by their breasts, people hung by their eyes, people fed their own flesh, people fed burning coals, people seated and eaten alive by worms, and so it goes on and on in the most unpleasant way. These tractates, together with the posterior literature, were amply elaborated on within the vast framework of Kabbalistic literature, which greatly widened and deepened the vision of hell with vivid descriptions of Satan, Samael, and of Lilith, accompanied by a multitude of them demons bearing the most fantastic names. As this is very far from my areas of expertise, I only limit myself to mentioning this fact. The first Hebrew author who should draw the attention, who drew the attention of many scholars, old and recent, in connection to Dante, was of course Emmanuel of Rome, Emmanuel Haromi, Manuel di Roma, or Manuelo Giudaio, as he is known in Italian. Manuel was a poet, a linguist, and a Bible commentator who was born in Rome in, 2061, in 1261 and died in Fermo, probably in the year 1328. In the history of Hebrew literature, he's chiefly known for his large satirical work, Machberot Immanuel, Immanuel's books, a series of 28 such books written in rhymed prose and interlaced with pieces of poetry. The concluding 28th book is entitled Machberet Tofet Va'eden, the book of hell and paradise. At the beginning of the book, Emmanuel tells his reader that having reached the age of 60, he began fearing death and summoned the prophet Daniel to show him what might be in store for him should he reach hell or paradise. 
Daniel then leads him on in Emmanuel towards the realms of hell, of hell first. Let me read to you one passage in the excellent translation of Hermann Golans, published in London exactly 100 years ago. I quote, there did we see a land of gloom, a great funeral pyre, its claim, its sparks of fire burning with the mighty flame. The stake was a fire and wood without end, nor day nor night, its force did spend. Then the man, Daniel said, this is the pile that gleams, burning as brimstone in the streams, reserved for souls full of rebellion's, rebellion's dreams. Would thou know why the wicked are here and what their name? Study closely the name on their forehead inscribed with their shame. Emmanuel then lists an extremely long list of biblical villains, among them Esau, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Amalek, the Pharaoh, Haman, and a multitude of others. And paired with those, Nebuchadnezzar, Titus, Aristotle, Galenus, Al-Farabi, Hippocrates, and finally, Avicenna. I wish to draw, to your draw your attention to the title Gollans gave his rendering, Hell and Paradise, in imitation of Dante's Inferno and Paradiso, from the Hebrew of Emmanuel del Solomon Romi, Dante's contemporary. For my subject today, this title is almost enough. Whether the book of it, whether the books of Emmanuel are, in truth, an imitation of Dante or not is almost beside the point. What matters is that they were thought of by generations of readers and scholars as exactly that. Modern readers, it should be noted, reject almost unanimously any serious comparison between Dante and Emmanuel. At best, they would agree, like our colleague, Professor David Fischerov, that the enormous gap between Dante and Emmanuel depends on the latter's interest in verbal activity rather than in history or theology. Or like Asher Sela, who wrote an extensive article about Dante in Italian, Jewish Italian literature, that in as much as Emmanuel competes with the literary model of Dante, it is only with the aim of creating something entirely different by using an exclusively Jewish frame of reference. The next author we should visit is the poet Moses Darietti, 1388, circa 1460, author of the monumental poem Mikdash Me'at, The Little Temple, begun in 1416 and never finished. This extremely long poem is a rhymed encyclopedia of Jewish and general knowledge. The general structure of Mikdash Me'at is meant to reproduce on paper the temple in Jerusalem, leading its reader from the entrance hall to the hall and finally to the Holy of Holies. It seems Rieti never brought this temple in verse to its completion. The second part is truncated and the third part is missing altogether. Alessandro Gueta summarized Midrash Me'at, eh, Mikdash Me'at in the following words, I quote, the poem contains materials of narrative, philosophical, theological, allegorical, historical, and juridical nature, filled out with prayers to God or his emanations. For his ambitious endeavor, Rieti adopted a poetic form hitherto unknown to all Hebrew poets in Italy who were present there as of the ninth century. Had the syllabic tercets with an interlocking rhyme scheme, that is to say, Dante's terza rima. Much like his illustrious predecessor, Yudal Kharizi, in the 12th century, 
who acknowledge his artistic debt to the great Arabic poet Al-Hariri, Rilti mentions the Commedia as his source of inspiration. This is an interesting passage, which I will quote in Raymond Scheindlin's brilliant English rendition. I quote, I whet my intellect and brace myself to make a book out of the sciences established by the ancients and arranged to their monument after, to be their monument after death. As I now consecrate my senses five and purify my thoughts as if with lie to build a house among the holy for my fame. For I have seen among the Christian folk a book whose themes are all imagination. In Hebrew, kol nosav dimyoniot. And I have made a convent with its style. The book is naturally Dante's Commedia. The following stanza is also interesting, and I quote, had their tongue suffered exile as mine by God's decree, their silly fantasies never could have been composed in verse. What Rieti means to say is that unlike Hebrew, which only expresses true knowledge attained through the intellect. Dante's Italian expresses uncertain knowledge conveyed by imagination. And he claims to Rieti, not to me. Rieti, as he stated quite openly, adopts the form only, not any of the content. As is Emmanuel's case, the actual affinity of Rieti to Dante is of almost secondary importance. What matters is that every mention of Rieti in literature brings about Dante, Dante's name inevitably. Let us continue. The next pair of authors that should be mentioned here are Rabbi Moshe Zakut, circa 1620 to 1698 and Yaakov Olmo, circa 1690 to 1757. Zakut, traditionally known by his acronym Remez, that is to say, hint of a secret, was born into a Marano family in Amsterdam, studied under one of the greatest rabbis there, continued his Talmudic studies in Poland, and finally, settled in Venice as a rabbi there. He was a prolific writer, a poet, a rabbi, and a Kabbalist. His play, Tofte Auch, Hell Prepared, was first published in Venice in 1715. Considered by some the first popular drama in Hebrew, Hell Prepared consists of 185 Five line stanzas telling the story of an anonymous rich dead man who is being shown the horrors of hell by a demon who leads his soul through its various circles. The learned ophthalmologist David Arie Friedman, who produced a modern edition of the play 99 years ago in Berlin, rightly called it the first Hebrew mystery play. A typical Baroque figure, Zakut filled his lines with paronomasia and homonyms or Hebrew gongorisms, as Professor Dvorah Bregman called those. In this element, it is in this element, especially present in the demon's long monologues in the second act of the play, that I see something that may be compared, however faintly, with the Dantesque principle of contrapasso. Let me try and exemplify this to the best of my ability. The, third, the 94th stanza reads thus, I quote in Hebrew, because the sound is of importance. Emesh penei dal bischi olalta, 
יצרך כעולה לך ואת בזמר, היום זמורתך כזמרת זמר תסרח, וזה לך מעלל עוללת, זמרת זמורתך אשר עוללת. Literally translated, this means more or less. Yesterday you trampled the face of the poor man in the mud. He was crying like a baby and you were singing. Today all that is left of you lays on the ground like a cut branch, stinking like a beast's cap carcass. And this is all the song of the glory you have accomplished. Zakut here plays with the various semantic meanings of the roots z, m, r, and e, l, l. The transformation of the dead man's fate is especially present in the play with the root z, m, r. That which was sung, zemer, of cruel victory became a cut branch, stinking like a beast's carcass, both zemel. It is quite futile to compare Zakut's hell prepared with the Comedia seriously. His vivid description of the torments of hell are entirely based on the aforementioned Midrashim and not on Dante and on select passages from the Book of Splendor, the Zohar. The same is true of almost of almost paradise prepared. The second batch of Midrashim that deals with paradise. However, from the perspective of that which interests me here, this is again of little importance. What matters in my mind is that Dante's work is ever present in the background. In the background. Whenever Zakut's plays refer to, Mention of the Comedia is inevitable. Many called Moshe Zakut the Hebrew Dante, wrote Friedman in the preface to his edition. The same circles gave the same appellation to Emmanuel of Rome and to Darietti. But in doing so, the givers never thought of any artistic or literary comparison. For them, the main thing was the Dantesque subject matter common to all three poets, hell and the torment of men in hell. I think this assertion is correct and sums up the matter aptly. Had my theme been limited to the history of Jewish writing in Italy, both in Hebrew and Italian, several other authors could have been mentioned. But this is not my theme. I therefore move along. The poets of the so-called Hebrew Renaissance at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries seem to have passed Dante's name almost in silence. When one of the two leading poets of the generation, Shaul Chernichovsky, asked in one of his later poems to adorn his desk with statuettes of those great poets, thinkers, and ancient gods that inspired him. He named Homer, Goethe, and Shakespeare, but not Dante. One of the younger figures of that generation, a minor poet, as he himself readily admitted, but a brilliant translator and a giant revolutionary in matters linguistic and political, according to some, Zdev Vladimir Jabotinsky produced the first incomplete but highly influential translation of several cantos from the Inferno into Sephardic Hebrew, which he himself helped to shape and stabilize. The next generation, that of Hebrew modernism, seems to, to continue ignoring Dante with two major exceptions. The poetess Lea Goldberg, who alongside Abraham Shlonsky and Abraham, Avraham Shlonsky and Nathan Alterman formed the holy trinity of Israeli modernism, spent much time 
studying Dante, teaching the Commedia at the Hebrew University and writing an extensive introduction to it. Among Goldberg's suppressed unpublished poems, put out not long ago by our colleague, Professor Gideon Tikotsky, one finds two pieces directly related to Dante. A cycle of three poems under the title, As I Was Reading Dante, and a relatively long nameless poem whose opening lines read, I quote, should the Roman poet come and take my hand and lead me to the inferno, showing me how the world atones for its sins. The subject matter of this poem was ever dear to Goldberg's heart, the cold, stupid crowd that remains indifferent to the poet's visions. Thus, she says in the first stanza, even if I'm led through the inferno by Virgil Dan as Dante was, and now I quote, when I return home, you will stare at me with the cold, disenchanted eye, conceive old commentaries and say, this is poetry, nothing but poetry. The three poem cycle rests entirely on the Paola and Francesco episode in Canto V of the Inferno. Is a, here is a translation of the second poem, which bears the epigraph, Ecadi come morto corpo cade. And I fell as falls a dead corpse, she writes in Hebrew. In my pity, my own soul is an inferno, which stupidly, naively, I built for myself with my own hands. One of the most brilliant, uh, now I would like to pass to another text, particularly dear to my heart. One of the most brilliant musical and bitterly humorous poets of Hebrew modernism was one who never set foot in Palestine. This was the poet Chaim Lensky the last Hebrew poet in Soviet Russia. In the 1920s, he led a group of young poets who insisted to keep on writing in Hebrew in spite of the state ban on that language. Almost all of the members of this cycle, known as the Leningrad group, were arrested during the 1930s. Lenski himself was arrested twice. First, in 1934, after Kirov's murder for a stretch of five years, and then again in 1941 with the advent of Operation Barbarossa. He perished in a labor camp in Siberia for as much as we know in 1943. Lenski's Siberian poems contain some of the most heroic and moving pieces of his poetic legacy. One such poem is Midat Hadin Tzanfautam Bachofen, the stern law clenched them in its fist. This sixth stanza piece is written in Terza Rima, which appears only this once in Lenski's entire corpus. It is intertextually linked both to the Inferno and to Alexander Pushkin's well-known poem of 1827, In the Depths of Siberian Mines, Vaglubinye Sibirskich Rud. Here is a crude translation of four of its five stanzas. The stern law clenched them in its fist, stuck a hoe in the palms of the children of science, and with bent backs, naked to their waists, under the skies of Siberia, in its soil, they dug Euclid's dimension, meter by meter, till they struck mammoth bones. But their hoe did not flinch of the limestone layers, as much as their spoon shakes when they draw some bone or a little fat from their daily Russian broth. 
a daily ration of broth. And I also am part of this mob. Shaking a drop of sweat from my upper lip, I hiss a flock of human sheep. Idiocy, idiocy, no backbone, none but underbelly. The whip itself despises them. Over them, one can only wail, may God have mercy. Lenski often described the camp as an inferno, wrote Professor Dan Miron, commenting on this poem. It is not by chance that this poem was cast in Terzina's, a clear reference to Dante's Inferno. The speaker in this poem regards the other prisoners with utmost contempt. He does say that he is one of them and shares their fate, but all he finds in them is idiocy, the idiocy of reptiles. They lack even distorted pain. The whip itself scorns them. He, on the other hand, remains a wholesome person if only because he can appreciate the Siberian sky, feel some compassion for the depth of its soil and the very prehistoric beasts in them." End quote. Let me finally pass to our own contemporary Israeli literature. One of Israel's leading poets, the greatest Israeli living poet, according to some, is May Wieseltier, born in 1941 in Moscow. It is generally acknowledged that his poetry has the widest intertextual spread among Israeli poets. Wieseltier has written two poems that directly relate to Dante. The first is a short poem entitled La Vita Nuova, which appeared in his 1976 collection something optimistic, the making of poems. It begins with this statement, I quote, it took me years to understand Dante, apropos Beatrice, and goes on to assert that there is an advantage in late understanding, for, I quote, this set of signs is no longer a deceptive hint, a bud of hedonistic wisdom, a trident of sweet, wise lies. In his pivotal collection of 1981, Exit into the Sea, there is another Dantesque, Dantesque poem that requires no special commentary, which I would like to quote in full. It bears the title Commedia et Sit, wooden comedy, I quote. At an almost equal distance between his day of death and his day of birth, a man enters a wood full of gardening workers. Of the trees around, some will be cut, some trimmed. Branches get separated from their trunk without a sigh. A trimmed tree will be vested in a new form, inadvertently. After a while, by conditional growth, it may tout it may touch an adjacent wall, maybe a fence, if at all, of another wall. Moving on, I now come to a younger author, the novelist, translator, and poet Alon Altaras, born 1960. Altaras <clears throat> is known, sorry, Altaras, known for his novels and translations from Italian, notably Ferrante's novels, began his career as a poet. Between 1982 and 1996, he published four slim poetry collections, the third of which is entirely based on the Vita Nuova and the Commedia. Almost each poem in this book contains a reference to, or a paraphrase of, lines and passages from Dante. Contrary to the custom of providing an English translation of the book's title, the name is translated into Italian, Il Foco Caffina. The book contains 30 poems, mostly dedicated to Altaraz's deceased mother and to an unnamed beloved feminine figure. 
I shall only quote one short poem that I think effectively represents the entire collection. I quote, unlike that Greek who broke his mother's heart with sorrow, and I'm like you who went to exile from your beloved city. Through reading, scrutiny, and study, I myself descend to the chamber of death. And as I love you when you were mortal body, so I shall love you when you become a skeleton. The last two lines printed between quotation marks are a paraphrase of lines 88 to 90 in the second canto of the Purgatorio, where, where, there, where they are uttered by the composer Casella, who says, Così com io tamai nel mortal corpo, così tamo sciolta. To conclude this survey of references to Dante in Hebrew poetry, mention should be made of a recently published book, The Rake, Hamagrefa by Sharon Haas, born 1966. Haas, who won several prestigious awards, holds a degree in classics, and is held to be an erudite poetess whose poems are filled with intricate reminiscences of ancient and modern literature. The Rake contains one poem that deals specifically with Dante a meditation following a long reading of the Commedia. It is too long to be quoted in full, so I only quote the opening lines. After more than 15 years of reading the Divine Comedy, I come closer to Beatrice, to the strange secret of her figure. How do you produce mystery adjacent to another mystery? I feel my lecture today will be grossly incomplete should I not mention one more recent work, the play Eros and Melancholy, written by our colleague, Professor Joav Rinon. Rinon's poetical translation of the entire Inferno saw the light of day in 2014. In the first act of part one of his new play, at a crucial point of the plot, which I will not divulge here, the entire scene of Paolo and Francesca is performed both in the Italian original and in his, own, in his own translation. Dante, as I've tried to show, has a firm presence in Hebrew letters. Certainly, this presence is limited in scope when compared to larger literatures. We don't have any dead souls in Hebrew. But to my mind, it is no less interesting. I thank you for your kind attention. Toda Ami, it's uh, really quite amazing. We could have had a whole conference just on the afterlives of Dante in, in Hebrew literature.